and has the agenda. So why don't I call the roll? Uh, Alan, Jill Allen? Here. Clinton? Here. Here. Spike? Here. Roland? Here. Uh, Friedman? Here. Reed? Here. Snow? Here. And we are missing uh, Angela Wilson and uh, Emma O'Rourke Powell. Perfect. Unless she has joined. I'm just trying to make sure I'm not missing anybody. Great. We have a very brief agenda. So um, I call for the uh, motion to approve the agenda unless there's any changes. So moved. No second. Okay, second by second. Could we have a vote, please? Kelly? Yes, sorry. Right. Okay. Um, so roll call again. Alan? Aye. Clinton? Aye. Flank? Aye. Roland? Aye. And so it passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, brief announcements from staff, commissioners, and liaisons. Are there any announcements? Kate, you always have great updates for us. Well, can you <laughs> kick us off, please? Sure. Uh, so let's see. Um, I think in terms of human relations, the things to note are that we have, um, uh, well, we were coping today with the outage, Comcast outages. Uh, but I think for in the forefront of the mind of the administration and leadership of the district is the mental health and well-being of staff and of students. Uh, and we're we're working really hard to figure out ways to support staff who are doing amazing things. And PTAs and groups of parents are also trying to find ways to support staff as well. Um, that we also, one of the, you know, as we know, this time has highlighted or amplified the disparities that were already existing. Uh, but one of the things that has sort of, um, come up into high, as a result of that, um, we have three um, adult groups that are focused on specific populations or groups of students, marginalized students. Um, three different kinds of groups, but, but I just want people to be aware that there is a, um, there's the Native American Parent Committee, which was has been in formation in the last couple of years, but then gelled as we made the application for Title VI funding for Indian education, which I don't know if I announced here, but we are receiving that funding. Um, we were notified in the summer, and that's based on students who were members of uh, enrolled members of state or federally or just um, uh, oh shoot, what's the word? Um, recognized. Tribes. No, state. No, federally and state recognized or. Um, the ones that have had their determination taken away, but through a certain act, so it still counts, their mm -hmm. enrollment still counts. In any case, Title VI funding is directly for those students only, but the district is dedicated to supporting all Native American students. Um, and a and really strong coalition of parents who are helping to run that committee, and we're developing a um, specific plan. There was a plan adopted for the funding, but because of COVID, it's being adjusted a little bit, but uh, it sort of includes equal amounts of um, academic supports and cultural education and pride. Uh, so that's one group. Um, secondly, our Black Staff United is in its second year of existence. They're open to all staff in the district, but they're dedicated, their mission, they sometimes call themselves BSU, which is Black Student Union, uh, the BSU for grown folks. Uh, open to all staff, but dedicated to supporting, especially the BSUs at Emerson Da Vinci and junior high and at the high school. They're the ones who are um, behind the, the organizing and the support for black graduation celebration this past couple of years. And also um, uh, it's a place for staff to support each other. And then thirdly, um, and so it's both a sort of social space as well as a, a kind of, um, just a good support space. And then thirdly, that we have, um, Ricardo Perez and I have started a Spanish speaking families and students partnership team, working with staff in all different job categories across the district who are working directly with Spanish speaking students and families in order to increase um, 
supports for them in a timely way and very specifically around the needs of COVID um, or of, of distance learning. And I'm trying to be brief here, but I do want to tell you <laughs> that um, uh, uh, the district was recently invited by Davis Schools Foundation to submit a grant because DSF had been invited by the Old Community Foundation to um, submit a grant proposal to support marginalized students or students um, disproportionately affected by distance learning. And, and so we put together within five days a proposal um, that, that supports those students through those three groups. So um, sort of authentic needs assessment coming from adults in those groups and then direct student support, um, which would include, if funded, would include culturally responsive technical support, items for celebration of culture, and, um, and a couple of other things. But that's the sort of gist of it. And then I also wanted to tell you something else, which has now left my head, but I will remember. Um, hmm. Uh, it'll have to come back to me, but I wanted you to know those things. Thank you. Hey, while you're uh, while you're trying to think of it, how many yeah. um, black um, staff or staff or faculty are there? In, um, in the school um, good question, Yvonne. It's hard to know exactly. Um, partly it changes, but partly um, there's no particular way of tracking black staff. People can choose or not choose to put their race and ethnicity on their employment forms. Okay. So there's some amount that are identified through the system, but um, but uh, many who don't identify when they when they um, fill out their paperwork for enrollment, but for employment. So the current Black Staff United has, um, I think there were. 10 or 12 people at this most recent meeting, the, the kickoff meeting. Um, one of them was me, a white person. And, um, and just to say that our, our organization with a group is that we um, have time that we work together. And then when there are other white people besides me, I take the white folks off into a room and we go to a separate room and we work on our stuff while this, so the black staff can have their time to be together. Thanks for asking. Yes, Gloria. Yeah. So I, um, I had a conversation today with someone who is a friend of my family, a family member who is a, a black staff and without giving any particulars, uh, was very upset about one of the, uh, about a background, about a virtual background that a student that they were supporting was using because it was Blue Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. And, um, this person found it, uh, has found it to be really upsetting to them and uh, to the point where they are um, just really having a lot of anxiety about it, having a lot of um, just emotional distress about it. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, I know that the, you know, that the free speech is to get really tricky, but you know they're feeling that this is um, uh, something that was, you know, very specifically put out into the world as a counter to the Black Lives Matter movements, and so finds it to be extremely distressing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering how the district is dealing with, you know, that sort of an issue because it's. It's quite clearly becoming a very real and very distressing issue for this particular person. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. Um, and so I'm glad to know, by the way, I'm glad to know that this staff uh, support group exists because I will definitely uh, direct them at least to get support and feel uh, like they're not so isolated in dealing with that issue. Mm -hmm. I can, um, Gloria, I can give you offline the email address of this a staff person who's organizing the groups. Um, uh, so you can send that to them. Uh, I would say uh, both in this specific case, but I would say that one of the things we're encountering as we, we're in this distance learning mode, I'll come back to this specific instance, but I want to speak to the broader um, phenomenon, which is that 
because the borders are looser between our classrooms and external materials, because we're working online, more things and things are coming in quickly, right? We're not going through the standard state adoption process for every piece of curriculum that comes in. So things are coming in provisionally approved. Uh, but what we find as we do that is that there are um, all kinds of things that come through, right? And even with the it's standard adoption process, right? All kinds of horrible oppressive curriculum has been used in school districts. Um, so we're, we're working on, um, there are some specific pieces of curriculum we're working on directly, but, uh, but also we're working on how to raise the level of critical assessment as things are being used and suggested both for social emotional learning activities and for um, student mindfulness and you know, various other kinds of, um, of uh, curricula that come in. And I think on the upside of things, there's a heightened awareness and we're getting, and, and not just from students, but from staff. Staff are more aware. Um, it, in the past, it's almost been exclusively families or students who have come to me with these uh, um, you know, uh, notices of things that aren't working. But at this point, there are a number of staff that are doing that. Um, so we have a long way to go, but that's one of the things we're facing in COVID. Um, with this, this question of the backdrop, um, again, a new technology challenge we've never faced before, but we have faced this question of, uh, is it okay to wear a MAGA hat, for instance, on campus, right? We've, we've dealt with that in the junior highs a couple of years ago, in 2016, four years ago. And is it? Just that I don't know what the outcome was, so. Um, it, it depends on the situation. I, I mean, free speech is, right, you're allowed to have political views. No, no, I under, I, I, I'm just wondering how it was resolved when there was a discussion at the school. In that case, it was a particular situation, um, but the... The bottom line for us as educators is you cannot disrupt the education of another student, right? You, the bullying and harassment begins with making a space unsafe to learn. So that's where we can begin to, we can sort of rest the argument about what we're expecting of students. Um, that said, I think we have, um, we have a greater number of I don't say quite tools at the ready, but we're, we're a little more agile or a little more, there are a few more, yeah, there are a few more tools at the ready to address situations like this. So then instead of um, uh, uh, so instead of sort of a single, um, single minded approach, say just a legalistic approach, there's a variety of ways we can address things. And um, we are committed to staff being safe and um, secure. And I can't speak to specific situations, but I can say that I'm aware of the one you're speaking of. And I guess that's being specific. Um, uh, can I ask a general policy question? Sure, yes. Um, is there a standard for what may be in, on somebody's background? And, and who decides that? Is it like the teacher during class? Because they can always shut the camera off if they feel mm -hmm. there's something inappropriate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I just want to caution folks not to get too far into this discussion. It's not actually- It's a little a update. <laughs> Good point. So, um, if you, you, can, you can continue to answer the question, but don't, get, mm -hmm. don't go too much further. Thanks, Kelly. Got it. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. No, and I be, maybe we need one of agendize how the schools are dealing with these questions overall. Um, uh, I have greater confidence than I used to have in the past about how things are being handled. Uh, and uh, I would, of course, if uh, the person you're referring to, Gloria, you know, always feel free to refer her to me. Um, and I um, believe uh, the situation is being addressed from multiple fronts. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for uh, the and depth of that explanation. I appreciate Sorry. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to note as well that Emma has called in, so she is now here. Hey, I'm here. I think she might have been here all along. We just didn't see her, but uh, she's been pulled over to this side now. Okay. Hello. Okay. Uh, yeah, I've been able to listen to the whole thing, so I'm happy to be here. Okay, Great. Great. I would like to um, a few uh, updates uh, from uh, the university. Uh, 
a number of you may be aware of some of these things uh, in town because they are usually uh, <clears throat> made uh, uh, made uh, notice of uh, through the media and the like, but uh, our students will be coming back uh, to classes and classes will be starting next week, I think on Thursday. Uh, as you know, um, we will be dealing with most of our classes uh, from a uh, virtual platform, but we will have some in-person uh, classes. So we were taking a great deal of precautions uh, uh, around testing uh, and some other protocols uh, for students if they do, in fact, get infected with the uh, COVID virus, uh, uh, what to do with that. Um, we've also uh, are working closely with the city of Davis because uh, whatever uh, protocols and things we have in place, we, we like for them to align with some of the things that are going on in the city, obviously, because a number of our students are uh, city of Davis residences, residents as well. And so we're making those kinds of uh, efforts and outreach to coordinate some protocols and things uh, uh, with especially the business communities and restaurants and things like that. Of course, we'll all follow the um, Yolo County guidelines and whatnot. Uh, but as those uh, things hopefully uh, become less restrictive, we still wanna make sure that we have uh, some very sound protocols in, in place for that. Um, also, um, uh, each student, each, all of the uh, students that are gonna be on campus will be in single housing uh, situations. So we will not have any doubles or triples or quads, although all students on campus will be uh, in a room uh, by themselves. Um, uh, so uh, that's something that uh, it's taken us a great deal of time to get together. We also have uh, put in place this year for uh, all new students, a, a new special component to the orientation. Uh, it is a required orientation uh, um, web uh, uh, online uh, webinar for uh, students to participate in that deals with issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, particularly focusing around uh, campus climate issues and issues of microaggression, uh, diversity awareness, and sensitivity, cultural competency, uh, and the like. And so all new students coming to campus are going to re be required to go through that. That is a, a new uh, online uh, module that's being rolled out here uh, now, but it's something that was developed UC-wide and uh, has already been rolled out, I think, at UC Santa Barbara and UC Santa Cruz. And so we're in the next uh, uh, phase uh, of the rollout of that. And that's a module that we developed with a company called EverFi. Uh, and then there, uh, I think you're aware that the city uh, uh, that the campus has also uh, created a task force uh, on campus uh, public safety. Uh, and uh, that task force is up and meeting. Chairs of, uh, co-chairs of that are uh, the Vice Chancellor for Diversity, Equity and Inclusion, Renetta Toll, and uh, Kevin Johnson, who is the Dean of the uh, law school. They are the two co-chairs. Uh, I made them aware of the um, uh, current processes ongoing in the city of Davis um, uh, with the uh, work that's being going on by the various commissions, uh, looking at public safety uh, and uh, reimagining uh, the issues and things in public safety in the city of Davis. I believe that they've already made contact with some of the folks on the other commissions, but I'm not certain of that. Uh, but I'll be able to find out next week when uh, I meet with uh, Renetta Tall, who uh, is one of the co-chairs. But hopefully, um, there'll be some close collaborations uh, uh, in the work that we're doing on campus with this public safety task force, uh, along with the um, uh, public safety issues that the city is looking at. Uh, we have a police accountability board and you have a police accountability commission. So we mirror each other in a lot of different ways. Uh, but, in, in, but in and of itself, we do have some unique issues uh, that are unique to each uh, uh, situation. So that's going to uh, be ongoing and up and running. And I'll just stop there because I just wanted to give some brief highlights. Well, we appreciate that very much. Thank you. And um, are there any questions for Raheem? And then I saw your hand before, Diane, in case it was related to Kate. Is it Kate's question or is it something else? Go ahead, go ahead then, Diane. It's a different announcement, so go ahead with your question. Okay. So are there any questions for either Kate or Raheem before we move on? Diane? Kate has a question of Raheem. Yes, please, Kate. <laughs> Wondering if there's a chance um, uh, I could get a look at the DEI curriculum for the students. 
the the orientation webinar. Oh, the the EverFi uh, module. Yeah. Uh, yes, I I, I will um, uh, send me an email, and what I'll do with that is I'll put you in touch with uh, Michael Villalobos in our office uh, because we just did a sort of a run through demonstration for the senior leadership on campus, and uh, I think he would be able to uh, to to run a demo of that for you. For the person who has his old job. I was gonna say, I think you're familiar with him, so am I. <laughs> Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Sure. Sorry for those who are familiar with me, with me on Zoom, every now and again, a dog needs to go in, dog needs to go out, so I apologize. Every time I disappear, that's what's happening. Um, I did have one question, and this might be related to either Gloria or Rahim that I read in the paper about a, a joint project for um, safety related to COVID that's um, going on between the city and the university. Gloria, did you want to talk about that? Or Rahim, do you know about it? Uh, I only know the, the general information that I, I noted. I note that, uh, that there's uh, an interest in making sure that we uh, closely collaborate because as we've often said, uh, the difference between the campus uh, and the city of Davis is A Street. It, on one side is the campus and on the other side is the city. So whatever measures and things that we're putting in place need to be in alignment with what's happening uh, in the region as a whole, uh, especially on the other side of A Street, if you will. So I know that uh, there is some discussion about collaborating. Uh, uh, we have, uh, we're trying to develop a very robust uh, testing and contact following uh, follow-up uh, 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 procedures uh, for folks uh, and uh, are certainly working to try to make sure that we limit our students to uh, small uh, gatherings uh, and would probably want to try to work with the city to make sure that that those same kinds of uh, uh, maybe uh, restrictions are, are, are maybe across the board so that you don't on one side of the street only can gather in groups of 10 but on the other side gather in groups of 150 uh, that sounds like that would uh, make good sense. And then certainly uh, all of the businesses and things that are impacted by this, uh, trying to work with them because as students come back in town, uh, certainly uh, that's, that's a welcome thing for businesses, I'm sure, but also a challenge for them uh, given the restrictions now put on uh, uh, indoor dining, for example, and, and the like. So I know that those kinds of things are all being discussed. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, with an eye towards how we can uh, collaborate and, and have things uh, that are synchronized. But I don't have any specific details. Okay, well, I see Gloria's, Gloria's back on the camera and Kelly popped in too. I know we're not gonna go too deep into this because these are only announcements. But yeah. Gloria, did you have something you'd like to say? Right, so I think there's a very large group of people that are on the team. I was really impressed with the number of stakeholders uh, that they are pulling together to make sure that um, you know that that the city and the and the university are doing as much as they can to keep COVID from exploding as it has on other campuses when you know everyone has come back into town and um, and so the the testing on campus is is going to be quite robust. And uh, some of that, um, some of the resources are intended to come into the community as well. And so uh, the contact tracing and the testing will be also extended for community members. Um, and part of that is also uh, uh, ensuring that vulnerable populations in the community are, are housed and, and um, and supported as well. And so it, it's kind of a very, very holistic approach that they are using um, uh, just to, uh, as I said, to ensure that uh, the community is, is safe and that the students who have come back into the, in, into, uh, the city are, are um, being followed and, and staying safe. Uh, so I, I think that the exact details of everything are still being worked out, um, but they're, they're, it, it'll start being rolled out more um, uh, robustly soon. Kelly, did you want to add anything? No, I think, I think you and Rahim covered it well. Thank you. Okay, Diane. Just a brief announcement that our city council did approve quite a significant grant through the um, arts and cultural affairs program to international house and they'll be facilitating 
uh, a few really key programs around artistic expression for uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color. And that includes a fully facilitated uh, conversation for the entire community around the possibility of creating permanent art in this space now in Central Park, where there is um, some, some artistic expression that's been up there for several months. And so not wanting to lose that to weather until we've started the process to capture it. Um, there'll be some diversity training specifically for local artists. Um, and leaders of art um, nonprofits, and then some support for a virtual um, international festival that will create a, a permanent marketplace and um, place on their website to give exposure to some art artists that will fall into that category. So that more should be known about that, but we're grateful to city council for approving that. Great, thank you. Any questions on that? Right, Leanne, do you have anything from Phoenix Coalition? Uh, yes, um, everything is online, obviously, these days. And the Upstander Carnival, which we've had in about mid-October for the last several years, uh, I'm not actively involved in the planning, but there is planning going on to have virtual activities around Upstander Carnival, uh, around anti-bullying for uh, school-aged kids. And we've been... Uh, trying to partner with other organizations and support some of their online activities and resolutions and things that are going on. So it's kind of behind the scenes right now, but that's what's happening. And uh, Gloria, do you have anything to add? I don't know if you're involved with the upstander planning. Yeah, so we're going to, rather than have just a day of a carnival, we're going to spread it out over the month. And we have a number of activities that we have planned um, uh, we're going to have like a kindness Wednesday and a coloring contest uh, th through the enterprise. And uh, we're going to have a, we're, we're trying to, to have a sort of a reflective walk that people can uh, come across in the green belts when they're, when they're, you know, walking through, they can uh, um, get messages around uh, anti-bullying and, and kindness and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so we've got a, a few things that we are hoping uh, that people can engage around uh, during the month of October, which is a National Bully Prevention Month. And I think historically we co-sponsor, but it's not on the agenda tonight. So we can, um, we can at least help to spread the word like on our Facebook page. So maybe we can get those and then um, Carrie can help to to amplify the those activities that are happening. All right. And this is, yeah, go ahead, Kate. Just want to ask, do you have the connections you need at the district for amplifying this, letting the letting people know at the district? So we are uh, we do have access to Peach Jar and um, it if there are other ways that we can get this out, it'd be great. If there was some if you could send me an email I could then make sure it goes through student support services and, and um, maybe it's something we could get directly to principals or something like that. Great, that'd be great. Okay, any other announcements? Anything from staff? Okay then, let's move forward to the next item. Public comment, is there any public? or public comment. And now is the time for public comment. So if there is public, if they could please press nine on their phone or raise their hand. Sheila, there is one public comment. Okay. Um, so let me make sure I can do this. Hmm. Okay, maybe I'm not getting, oh, there we go, allowed to talk. Uh, sorry, Diane, that was my fault, I hadn't. Mm -hmm. Major we got it. Connor Gorman, you are unmuted. Hi. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I just have a, a brief announcement myself because the UC came up. So I just want to say that there's a UC wide Cops Off Campus campaign now that uh, some people who are listening to this meeting might be interested in. So essentially, 
We know that there's a lot of push around policing in the county and the city, but there's also a movement on the UC campuses now that is UC-wide, including Davis, to redirect the funding for campus police to student and worker needs as opposed to the policing, which we know on campus is often used against protesters and other demonstrations and rarely used to actually create any sort of real So that's something that people might be interested in. Uh, it's on social media. I've heard that the website is coming. There's also upcoming events for that for people to uh, find and participate in as well. So I just wanted to make that announcement because we know that committees and task forces in the UC don't really actually do anything. They're mm -hmm. often designed to stifle the momentum of a movement and to kind of wait it out until the main organizers have left. So this is a more direct campaign from grassroots students and workers to redirect that police funding away from the policing and to the services. Thank you, Connor. Okay, is there any, Diane, is there any other public comment? No other public comment. Thank you. All right, next agenda item is the consent calendar, which is, is the um, August 27th special meeting minutes. Are there any additions or corrections? Okay, seeing none, uh, is there a motion to approve? Okay, I saw you raise your hand. I'll make a motion to approve. Okay, move, is there a second? I second. Okay, thank you, Ron seconds. Kelly, can you call the roll? I can if I unmute myself. <laughs> um, all right, so Alan. Aye. Clinton. Aye. O'Rourke Powell. Aye. Plank. Aye. And Roland. I saw her mouth say aye. Okay, we'll <laughs> go with aye. <laughs> okay, then on to the next agenda item, which is discussion related to defining community health and public safety improvements. Um, this is the report from last night, so it's, oops, there's the timer for the end of public comment. <laughs> um, so it's the uh, subcommittee what was assigned to this topic. It, the subcommittee is uh, Judith and myself and Emma, and it's my understanding, Judith, that you are stepping down. Is that correct? That is correct. I've got a lot on my plate, and I'm stepping down from that uh Subcommittee. Yes. Right. Thank you. I, I understand that. So you were not able to attend last night. So, um, but Emma was there for a, a good portion of the meeting, even though my I had my uh, my screen was too small, so I didn't see when you arrived. So I apologize that I didn't know that you were there. So thank you for being there, Emma. So, um, where to start? Well, with a with an update. Is there was there anyone else who was at the meeting? Well, um, Kelly was there clearly. I don't think Diane was. Uh, so, hmm. It's an, so just as a reminder, it's a, where we, I jokingly call it the Triwizard Committee because there are the three committees that it is um, the, our Human Relations Commission, Social Services Commission, and the Police um, Accountability Commission. Each of them have representatives on this committee. The City Council asked that we look at um, defining community health and public safety improvements, which is a very broad topic. And um, in my, I will start with my opinion and then we'll talk about some of the things that we talked about. And, and I think we still, the committee still somewhat struggles with what it is that we're trying to accomplish since it was a very um, broad topic to begin with. And so um, we are doing the best that we can to right now, we're still in the gathering information stage. And um, we hope to be able to have both that information, some possible recommendations along with some community input that then we can provide to the city council who will then 
have the actual conversation to be able to decide about if there should be some and what they would be for some community health and public safety improvements. How's that for an overview, Kelly? Does that sound about right? Okay, good. Uh, so the, um, the way that we divided the tasks out is that by commission, we had uh, assignments between the, the meetings with slightly mixed results. Um, the Police Accountability <laughs> Committee was supposed to be, what was their topic, Kelly? I was trying to remember from the, they were supposed to be doing community outreach, right? Yeah, they were supposed to be talking about community outreach and they, um, one person came back with a, a very in-depth plan on how, on, on a community conversation about um, mental health, about the signs and symptoms of mental health and how to address it as a community and what to do about services for mental health going forward, which is a really great topic and I think a discussion that would be great to have in the community, but was a little off target from having a community, having general community input about public safety improvements. Is that fair and accurate, Kelly? Okay, so that was one, one group's um, presentation. And then um, from the uh, social services, actually they have already done quite a bit of research um, yeah, from their committee and from their participants on um, research on different models of in particular policing and um, for, it's mostly a, um, different policing models um, last night, they um, didn't give an update on that, but to get a, give a general update on the outreach that they've done to other groups um, and other um, key informants in the community to be able to have some, um, some more broader input on these subjects. And then at the next meeting, I believe that they'll be coming back with the models that they gave to us the last time with some um, possible uh, suggestions of how what those kind of if there were model changes what that would look like in davis does that sound does that sound about right kelly okay good okay i was at the same meeting all right great <laughs> and then from the um human resources committee i went through the um document that emma and i um talked about and developed and thank you emma for seeing that through and getting it um out uh and i think we were coming at it with some of the back work that might have been helpful to begin with about what is the question that we're trying to answer and how that we how we might collate the information and we're hoping that the other committees would catch on to that so that we would be able to have better package this information to prevent to present to the city council um, our particular topic was on what resources are available in the community already I think um, part of the uh, well, perhaps it's the community outreach, but it was clear to me from the um, the public comment that came to us initially and some uh, some additional emails that have come to us that it, you know, there may be some additional public uh, education that needs to happen because there's um, there's some some people in the community think that like we shouldn't be doing a certain thing like for example we shouldn't be arresting people who are homeless. Uh, or um, that we we really should be able to you know connect people to mental health services when they need them instead of putting them in jail, and in fact those kind of things are happening already. So we wanted to um, Emma and I want to kind of see about what kind of things are already happening, so that we can be clear both to the community and to the city council. I'm sure the city council knows what the city is doing clearly, but that there are some additional community resources that either could be used by the police or community, the, the city of Davis community services or the public in general. So that's where we landed. Emma, can you jump in now and you were there also and heard some of the discussion? Yes, happy to. Um, and it was a really great overview of uh, two, I think we've now had two meetings since the last HRC meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so kind of uh, two rounds of, of process work. I, I think one of the kind of meta themes of the experience is this clear interest in wanting to um, understand the extreme importance of the issue and take it very seriously and um, proceed accordingly. And then balancing that with, uh, if we don't pause to make sure we're running in the right direction, we could be running in fact in the wrong direction. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that 
we're trying to sort out as a group. And um, as Sheila indicated, with such a big charge, it's a little, um, sometimes we, we can't be mind readers yet, having only had a couple of uh, co-meetings. And so still trying to sort out how to get through all of that. However, um, I think we got to some key action items by the end of last meeting um, around uh, reorienting to the importance of adding in some more research on um, best practices in uh, working to end racism and bias um, kind of across disciplines. There's a big focus on doing it within the context of the police but what, what about other um, functions as well? And that was a really great discussion. Um, so what, that was a, a homework item for the PAC um, to kind of go back and, and look at research around ensuring that um, we're kind of looking at, yeah, policing and racism and mental health and um, budgeting and finance, kind of the, the ways that all of those are interplaying rather than getting too getting um, stuck on just policing or just mental health services. Um, so I think that that was a really good takeaway from last night. And then kind of also thinking about how we're going to dovetail our efforts um, in that, like the question about having um, community outreach dovetail with work being done by Yolo People Power. They have a, a voices project where they're doing interviews. So how can those groups come together um, and make sure that we're not missing any key themes, making sure that we're hearing from everybody, uh, but also not um, moving at a glacial pace. And then I think that gets to kind of one of the areas that we're still sussing out a little, which is um, when it comes time to have a deliverable for the city council, will it be um, actual uh, results of work done? Um, like having, for example, a complete resource list, which feels pretty doable, or will it be um, an outline of a well thought out and robust process that we'd recommend to the city to continue with? So maybe something like the community outreach, which is gonna be a little bit more intensive, perhaps we, that won't be completed, but we'll be able to put together a work plan. So that's what I would add. Sheila, is that helpful? Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you. Um, I Towards the end of the meeting, there was quite a bit of discussion about the different buckets that we had of, of areas that we want to look further into and that we have looked into. And there was a discussion about um, the uh, substance use and how that interplays with uh, law enforcement and policing, a lot of discussion about mental health and how that could be better addressed, and also with um, persons who are currently unhoused. And it was very interesting that way late in the meeting, we, it was brought back about, oh yeah, and, and uh, uh, systemic racism too, which is kind of where we started the whole discussion. But yet when we were doing our assignments and doing our, our presentations, um, I thought that was, well, at least to me, that was interesting that 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 little bit was dropped. So I was really glad that we had a chance to begin talking about it and that PAC is good, has their homework to be able to do something about it. Um, I had an email from a public member who didn't comment but was, uh, what, but watched the whole thing. And um, I thought that she had a great observation is that she said that she still feels, she's watched all of them. She still feels like that we might not have defined what's the question we're trying to answer and also looking at, you know, when we're looking at um, not only like what are the current resources out there, but what's actually happening in particular in um, relationship to systemic racism, what, what's happening here? Because there's discussion about what's happening nationally, what's happening in Portland, but that um, there might be more of a need to look what about Davis because that's you know that's what we're looking at right now and that's where we can I mean that's the the beauty of local government is that it's easier it's, it'd be very it's very difficult to change the U.S. but it might be a little easier to make some progress in Davis so to kind of bring the question is like okay so we have all this research but but what about in Davis what's happening now and what is the roadmap to get to where we want to go 
So I thought that was insightful and helpful to me at least. Um, the other thing that I talked about at the meeting was a, a brief discussion that I had with a, uh, the actual social worker or one of the social workers from Communicare who is the person that they, when they have somebody during work hours, which is kind of interesting, um, that has either a mental health or a substance problem at that moment that they um, bring them over to Communicare in Davis at 600 A Street. My mailbox is there for work, so that's why I got to see her there. And she said that before COVID that they were really kind of getting into a, a good rhythm about how um, identifying who needed to have the help and getting them over there. And that um, currently locally with, between Communicare and the police that there was a, a good communication and good relationship developed. And so she, she felt that that might be something to build on as, some, as, as a practice that's working right now, not that it's perfect. She said one of the big problems is that they close at at 10 o'clock so that at night if you got, you got to have your mental health and your drug issues before before nine o'clock or there's there then that that system doesn't work so that would be something to look into and then the other thing that she said because there's been uh the police chief and then one of the models that was presented to us was to have when it looks like there might be a mental health um, issue associated with a 911 call to send out a social worker and police officer together. And I asked her what she thought about that. Did she think that that was a good approach? Um, is that, and she said sometimes they actually call them before they go out so that they would know. Um, and she suggested that it might be that uh, to have a social worker that would be part of the 911 phone call before something uh, was sent, before anybody was sent out. Because she said often in a town of our size, it's somebody who is already a part of the system and that they know about. And then she said, then it wouldn't be, police don't have to go out there. So just a social worker can go out there because they know the person, they have the relationship. Um, but if it's an unknown person or a new person that she said she is a social worker would be uncomfortable just being sent out to an urgent situation without another person along with her. And she says she feels comfortable with the police there and that her experience, and she's done this, is that when they get to the place, that it's often clear who needs to be the initial lead and then they work, work together and then, you know, it might be the police first just to get things calmed down or something, or it might be her going first to talk to them. Um, but she thought that it really needs that it works well to have it be a team, but it might be that you want to get um, the social workers earlier rather than just at the scene of, a, of an urgent problem. So I, that, was, that was helpful to me to kind of talk through how, what, how has it happened now and for somebody who actually knows the population that has worked in it, um, how, how it might be better. So what I was hope that's our report. Unless Emma, did you think of anything else? No, and I had missed that part of the meeting, so thanks yeah, for summarizing. Did you got to hear that? Um, Kelly, you were there also. Would you could you think of anything else that would be helpful to let the commission know about? No, I think you you guys both covered it really well. Um, yeah, I would just stress that I, I felt like there was a good sense last night, and it was very clear from each of the different groups what their homework was. And so the group will be will plan to meet. We don't have a date set up yet, but we'll plan to meet again in about a month. And um, the idea would be at that point in time to be able to see where they are, um, consolidate either, as Sheila said, either um, questions to bring to council and or some recommendations or uh, background information. So um, the idea is that then each of the subcommittees would go back to their respective commissions and say, this is what we're planning to bring forward. Do you give it a thumbs up or not? and um, make sure that there's uh, support from the full commission from each of the groups. So a little bit of an unwieldy process, but I think we're getting some um, good, good difference of, of perspective and good backgrounds um, from different, different folks. So worthwhile. So what I was hoping that we would do to, oh yes, Gloria, please. So I remember, I recall uh, Darren mentioning that the, the, um, hmm, the practice of sending a social worker out with a police officer uh, under certain situations was done in the past. 
but that that program had lost funding. Was that correct? Um, yeah. And I'm just wondering if there there must be some um, some information from that time period that that it gives uh, some sort of insight into how well that worked and um, you know just sort of to compare uh, because if that's been if that was you know previously done I would be curious to know how successful that they felt that was and if you know if we can compare um, that time period to to what's going on now uh, for those types of for those types of incidents, and then the other thing is, I think I saw an email from the Finance and Budget Commission. I don't know, Kelly, if that came through. If you, it, and I thought that that was something that was um, sort of discussed around this process. Yeah. So that the email was just that the Finance and Budget Commission does have a. Um, the way they've divided their, themselves, they do have a subcommittee that looks at public safety. Now they're looking at it in terms of public safety and its budget, um, but they were just offering to be a sounding board or offering to provide any help if help was desired. So. It's good to know. Yeah. And I, I know I reported this last time, but um, just as a reminder that the, um, oh no, I forgot what I was gonna say. I don't know. It was a great reminder. I'll think of it in a moment. <laughs> this is only my fifth or sixth Zoom for the day, so I'm... <laughs> um, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Judith. Yes, please. Okay, could you repeat? Uh, you said someone from the public uh, had been watching the, the videos, the meetings, and could you repeat that comment? And did you just find that out tonight, or was it, was it announced before the meeting so that you could discuss it? No, no, it was not. I, we did not have it. She didn't send it to the whole group. She sent it just to me personally, and it was after the meeting. So I'm just sharing with you some public comment that I received so that because I, I found it helpful just as somebody who was um, outside looking in just watching the process without being a part of it. And um, what did she say again? Oh, well, she said that it, it uh, that two things that she said that it, it seemed to her, although, you know, Kelly, we are, I think, getting some better direction and some traction on what it is that we're, what we're heading for. But she said that she felt that it looked like the, it would have been uh, helpful to define what, what the question was we were trying to answer at the start of this process, rather than trying to work through some things and then come up with a question. So that was um, one thing and that she um, wanted to, oh, she said that she thought it would be good to look at, um, especially in relation to the racial disparities to see, because um, there was a lot of discussion about national research and other places what happened, but that she hadn't heard about, um, besides the statistics about, about arrests, but that she hadn't seen a lot of local information, that that might be a, a better, that might be a good place to get some information. So we have local information on that. Even though that social, that social, social science, excuse me, social services commission, wow, those, those researchers, excuse me, they're not part of the commission, the researchers associated with, that was quite a powerhouse presentation. So right. that, yeah. seemed, that seemed to touch on many local, local aspects. Mm -hmm. So, um, it was amazing. So I was just wondering, maybe she didn't see that, or maybe she did. Who knows? Oh, okay. she did, and I think that. And there also was a bit of back and forth between the. I think they're called Jola People Power is the name that the research group is, and the police department about the about the data and how they categorized it, and information for a call might not be what actually happened when they wow. arrived. So there's a little, you know, they're still working out some of the specifics on the data. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yes, great. That's great. Thank you. So I was hoping for the purposes of tonight, first of all, I wanted to inform you what, what has happened thus far. But as members, appointed members and community representative of the Human Relations Commission and with our lens, I was hoping to have a, at least a little discussion about what you've heard from what the process is so far, what um, our particular assignment is in relation to resources, and if you have suggestions or input going forward. I'd like to open it up now to your perspectives, members. Helen, I know you always have something going on in your mind about what you think. I want, I'd like to hear it. You have to unmute though. 
right now I don't have a mind. Um, I guess I'm, I'm still struck with not understanding how you can collect data toward a decision if you, if there hasn't been a more articulated problem, sort of what the woman who contacted you um, raised. Um, and I'm a little bit under, unclear about how, all right, everybody's going home with homework, each of these groups, and was sort of wondering why the groups are doing it in by commission rather than you know having a person from this commission and a person from that commission and the third commission working on a problem i mean i'm i'm not sure that what i'm saying should be done at all please understand that but i've sort of wondered why um people are getting homework by Although I can't eat really, I don't understand who's doing the, who's setting the homework, who's doing all the, who convenes these meetings? So let me ask some just basic questions for someone who, like me who doesn't know what the hell is going on. Who convenes the meetings? Kelly, you want to answer that? Sure. So it's a little bit of an unorthodox process, but um, it's each of the three commissions decided that they wanted to have a subcommittee to work on this. And so those three subcommittees have come together and are meeting together. Right. But because of that, when we go through the, if we make it a formal public meeting so that it happens in the public. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good thing, but it makes it a little bit, I use the term unwieldy. It makes it a little bit unwieldy to, to actually try to, to manage, but it's for the appropriate reasons. When I say, so let me back up. There's not, it, it's not a formal group. It just needs to happen in a public manner, in a public way. So there's not an official chair, but it so happens that the three chairs of each of the commissions are on this group. And so they're sort of taking turns facilitating the meetings. Okay. Um, so that's kind of how things are moving along. And then the, the agendas are really based on what the groups, the individual commission subgroups decide that they want to look at. And so when they come together, they're trying to see whether or not their information is complementary or is, uh, they don't want it to be duplicative, obviously. So they self-divided um, at the last previous meeting, two meetings ago, they self-divided into a couple of different categories where they each felt that their commission could have the most effect um, or where they were sort of the most interested. And when I say homework, what I meant was that they each, each of the subgroups agreed to go away and over the next few weeks, um, collect some more information or talk to some people or some organizations um, or put, to, you know, uh, analyze some information that they've gotten, they've looked at different, different things depending. So the idea is when they come back together, they will have, they'll be all the smarter and they'll have some more things to talk about. Um, again, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit unwieldy and I think Sheila and Emma would probably agree, but uh, they're just trying to get to a place where they can go back to the city council or go to the city council and provide information to the council that is helpful for the council to then make further decisions. Does that help, Helen, or did I just make it worse? <laughs> no, but I think what you said is what people have said. I, you know, and, and please understand, I'm super tired, so I'm probably not making any sense. It's just, um, <clears throat> okay, let's just take the human relations people, right? Sheila and, and uh, Emma. Emma and, okay. So your homework is looking at resources, correct? Resources for what? You're muted, Sheila. Opening windows in here. Um, uh, for the, the three areas that we talked about that, uh, that can be associated with when um, police might be involved or there might be a community issue. So for substance use, mental health, and um, persons who are unhoused. Okay. 
And so you're, you're developing information around each of those three things. Yes. Correct. Okay. And some of that information is what the city currently offers or is planning to offer, but it also includes things like what does the IRWS offer and things like that. Is that Pardon correct? He has a lot of services that, that some are nice, but they might not be used in all of them. Correct. Um, okay. So, um, and then you'll all come back together having done whatever your piece of the question is mm -hmm. um, and report. Yes. Um, and then there'll be another iteration where it'll go to the commissions to know what people are talking about. And eventually it'll develop into some kind of a report that will go to city council. Right, and it's fairly short timeline because if we look at um, going to the city council in November or early December, we really have to have this wrapped up by early November so that we can have the recommendations to bring back to our commissions to look at and then come back and vote. So it's um, a fairly short timeline, which is why we were doing the homework in between because if we only met one hour, you know, for a couple hours every other every month, we wouldn't get very far. I'm, I'm, again, I apologize because I really, really am super tired. Um, <clears throat> but I still don't see how you're going to get it done to take back in November if you probably aren't going to meet for three weeks from now. You know, you're mid-October and how is a report going to get written and approved by all three of these subcommittees? I mean, the, all three of these commissions. I have faith it will happen. Yeah, I think we'll get as far as we get. And we also um, agreed that with our timeline, it's not going to be a pretty little finished packet, with, you know, in a binder with a bow on top. It's going mm -hmm. to be, here's the research we've done. Here's the information we have. Here's the community in, uh, input that we've received. Because I'm, I'm assuming that the, when the I mean, we have, a, we have our mayor right here on there, that we're going to give this information to the city council who will look at the information that we have gathered and, and the initial recommendations that might be coming from three of their commissions. And then they will use their process, their public process, their discussion to see now we have this much information. Now they will take it and, you know, baton, hand it to them, and then they'll continue down the road with it. Okay. And when are you guys going to do recommendations? We're going to early November, right? We're going to have to have it done by our something by late October, early November. Right, Kelly? No, if, if the, yeah, the, the timeline is, is that we would likely go back to council um, either the November 17th meeting or December 1st. It just kind of depends on how the, the calendar plays out. And at, to Sheila's point, um, council didn't ask for a, a, a completed package and, and council hasn't really had the chance to have a, a in-depth conversation on this topic. They talked about it briefly, um, somewhat briefly, <laughs> a budget item in June, um, but it hasn't, they haven't had a chance to talk about it since. So some of the recommendations or comments may be, we think you should look further into X or um, ask more questions about Y. Um, I should have said Z, not Y, but you get the idea. Mm -hmm. And so there, there isn't the, there isn't a way that I don't think that the group could come back with a fully, fully baked package. Um, well, I wasn't thinking that. I was just trying to figure out timeline in terms of the three groups meeting, and then coming back, and then the three groups meeting, just to get the we think you should look at yeah it's a little bit of commission jenga kind of i'm sorry it's like commission jenga the game where you <laughs> have to add things up but um you know one of the commissions may have to have a, a quick special meeting um we haven't figured out the whole the whole calendar yet okay. But okay. totally understand the the timeline is did you have any thoughts on the the just um other things about the resources or the, and, and if I, cause I, um, 
why are we looking at resources? That might be a question that you, that you ask. And one of the initial discussions that we that um, came to us the first meeting was the question of could it be that we might want to um, and we had the organizational chart of the police department where there's sworn and then there's unsworn people and right. then the, um, on the other you've frozen <laughs> the chair has frozen <laughs> hopefully she'll come back <laughs> She will. All right, who's vice chair? Mm -hmm. Judith. <laughs> okay, we shall proceed with this meeting. Um, I think she'll probably come back in a moment. So as, she, as Sheila was saying, she was talking about questions about the resources. Everyone got a copy of the resources that Emma and Sheila put together, is that right? I think everyone saw that. It was quite a, quite, a, quite a great template. I'm not sure if everyone did, but uh, Sheila was just talking about having, if, does anyone have any questions about the resources or maybe HRC's role in the subcommittee or anything more specific? Are there any questions that anyone has? Or, um, I, I, will you finish? I'm not sure if you were finished yet. Yeah. I would like to get a copy of the resources that was, were put together. I don't know why. I missed it if it came to me, but that would help. I, I don't know that we, um, I don't, we put together a work plan for working on resources. Yeah, it was just um, sent, it wasn't sent to the HIC commission, that's right, it wasn't, I remember that. Excuse me, Emma, for interrupting me, so yeah. You're saying it yes, was it's, and presented to the subcommittee, yes. But anything that was presented to the subcommittee, we can send to the full commission if, if people are interested in looking at it. That's fine. There's nothing, there's no secrets. No, I, I didn't think there was anything secret. I thought I was just missed it. Um, and it might have helped me answer the questions. <laughs> yeah, it's really well written. And then, as I just said, it's true. It was sent to the subcommittee. So it'd be great to have you all read it. It's very well put together. So um, thank you. Who Sheila is back. <laughs> oh, Sheila. Hello, Sheila. Yes. Oh. She's still muted, though. She's muted, though. There. Hello. Sorry. Okay. You're very, you're very uh, adept. Vice Chair took over, and you're frozen. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> so sorry. Carry on. You're welcome. I think oh. we were at the end of the sentence. Well, we were talking about when you left, you were asking about questions about resources, and I was, uh, we were all reminded that the resources template, the wonderful piece of work that you and Emma put together, was just sent to the subcommittee members. So um, Helen and others were saying that they would love to have a copy, and I think that's a fabulous idea. Yeah, that would be great. And I, I think, I don't know when, when you lost me, but um, I was like trying to go back, like, why do we need to think about resources? It was because of the division. I know I started talking about that and I heard, saw some nods. Um, so the reason why for the resources is what, what does some, but what needs to happen so that um, public safety can be improved? So part of it is the, the homeless uh, addressing uh, the, the issue of people who are currently unhoused. And then also we th we're thinking more of the mental health piece and about the substance use. So that's why we're bringing those pieces of information in, um, in the event that the city might wanna see about what, how they can beef up that part of it, because it might be helpful to address public safety in general. And also if there's a, a discussion about dividing out the police department, that that could be where those kind of um, resources would be housed is in, in that part. At least Have you looked mind. at the city's, city's, the social services commissions, just a second, it's sitting here. Um, health and social services guide, mm -hmm. it has a lot of that information on it. Uh -huh. Well, I'm sure that we will be utilizing that also. Well, I just didn't know if you knew that it even existed. That's why I'm raising it. I mean, my subcommittee on the homeless, on homeless stuff is, is collecting data up to update it, but at least gives some idea of what this is. And it's pretty comprehensive. 
So I think that rather than reinventing the wheel, starting with that, you could go from that and see what else. That is an excellent idea. Thank you, Helen. Um, other thoughts or ideas about either well, the, the process or the substance of the changing or addressing public safety needs of Davis? Judith, did you have anything that you'd like to add? Yeah, so a few meetings back um, in public comment, I don't know if you talked about this last, at the last night's meeting or not, but you know, the whole title of public safety, um, we, we, just, we talked about changing it to community safety. Have you addressed that, the idea of the power of words? Has that been addressed yet in the last two meetings? Um, because so many people understand that public safety means something else, you know, more like incarceration and all those things. At least that's what it seems to mean on the, on the, the voting pamphlets and things. So has there been any discussion about that, changing public safety to community safety? We haven't had any further discussions about that. But that's a good point to bring that back again. And I, I think it's interesting what you say about the, because to me, um, well, I like community safety as a community health nurse and you know, doing a lot of public health kind of work. But to public safety to me doesn't bring that to mind. But I think it's important. That's why you, you ask a lot of different people. If I think of like a police officer as opposed to a, a, a public safety officer or something, that, that has a different tone to it. But yeah, um, and I'm not sure. I, I'm sort of in the same boat as you, but uh, the, the person who spoke from the public was very artic articulate about that. And seemed to make it clear that there were a number of people um, that did consider public safety something that should be changed. So that was interesting. I think it was that night we had so many um, speakers. Yeah. It was amazing, on and on. Yeah. But that was one aspect I do remember. So okay, yeah. um, great. You'll probably just bring it up. I am. I put a little star next to it, so hopefully I remember. And maybe our note taker will help us remember, since she helps to craft our agenda. All right, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else have any comments on, on the process or the substance or where we go next? Gloria, do you think are we are we? Oh, so Kate had Kate had had raised. Go ahead, Kate. I just had a short note about um, uh, considering young people as we're doing the the planning, so that I think often it's easy to forget that when we're talking about public safety. Um, I think our minds go to adults and just, and maybe to college students and, and we sort of relegate young people to schools. And so to remember to think about ways in which um, community safety or public safety involves them. And there's the obvious connection between the sort of school to prison pipeline from our perspective, from the district's perspective, but, um, but just also thinking about young people. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that perspective to the table, Kate. We appreciate it. Um, and Gloria, did you, would you like to come? Do we, are we heading in the right direction? Is this helpful work that we're doing? Because you're going to be the consumer of this eventually. I think that it is. I think from the perspective of involving the community and the commissions, it's, it's really important to have those voices as, as part of the process. And so I think that, you know, regardless of uh, where, where it all kind of goes to, it's, it's, um, the process is important. And, um, and so, yes, I, I, I think, as, as you said, you know, it's not going to be all very tidy and there'll be a lot more questions, but, um, but giving people the opportunity to to you know, show up at these meetings and to have people think about this is is really important. So thank you. Thanks. Well, good. We're trying. I can tell you that. <laughs> Anyone else with any comments? Yvonne, we haven't heard from you. Would you like to say anything? No, you're good. Emma, did you want any, any after listening to the, to the conversation both last night and tonight? Anything additional? I think just. Um, I love Helen pulling a resource forward for us and, and yeah. for the whole commission to just be, uh, you know, extending our homework to all of you. If you, um, anything comes to mind over the next couple of 
days or weeks that seem relevant to the this task force, um, please send it. I think it's okay, Brown Act wise, if you send it to me and Sheila. Um, is that think so? I think you can excellent. send it to Carrie, and Carrie will will distribute it to. Is that right, Kelly? That would be well, nice. if it was to help. Okay, I was going to say if it's helping us in our work, Sheila. I wasn't sure, but maybe that's right. Yeah, I think just any information is supposed to go through Carrie. It's just cool. it's just better that way if we get into practice of doing it. That's all. Yeah. Okay. So at our, I'm assuming at the next time that we, one second, that we get together, I'll finish my sentence and I'll get to you, Judith. The next time that we get together, it is possible that we will have, well, we'll definitely have more information for you. <laughs> it's possible that we might have some sort of direction or even initial recommendations for you to respond to. So we'll see how far we get into in the process by the next time that we meet. Yes, Judith. Yeah. yeah, I just had one final question. I know that the chief of police showed up at the meeting last night. I'm a, I think he was going to be there. Is that correct? He was there? No. He said he, sh oh, maybe, oh, I'm sorry. It was the, it was the one before. It was the one meeting. before, yes. He did um, come and talk about the, the current structure of the police and about the data and also about the organizational structure, which I found to be very helpful. But I I, that I, before we change something, we need to know what we have now before we try then, to change I believe it's correct that the, the researchers, um, was I watching this? That was the last meeting. Yeah, you had one last night and I haven't seen anything yet. I was watching the video for the previous meeting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the chief of police was there and there was a whole nother presentation that rebutted the, the police, what they said. So um, I just think it's the rest of that video. I think I was mixing up the nights, yeah. Okay. So I think the chief of police came and, he, and I'm wondering what their response was to this amazing rebuttal by the, all the researchers to what the police did say, say in their report. So in, I, in answer to this question, I will just finish watching the video. I'll do that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. I do, um, Kelly, do you think that it would be, well, first of all, appropriate, because I don't only want to do things, uh, things that are legal. I don't know about appropriate, <laughs> um, legal, and then um, helpful to have, since this commission received the report that went to social services, um, then I don't think that they've seen the response from the police department and then there was a response from the, the researchers to the response. Would that be, is that, first of all, that's legal for us to... Oh, yeah, to yeah absolutely. Yeah, I can send, um, I can send both of those, or I can, Carrie actually can send both of them. Okay, I think uh, it's helpful to kind of see how, and there's, um, some of it is, oh, now that there's a little bit of, well, they're going to agree to disagree on things, but some of it was that there needed to be some clarification of, in particular, the, um, how the, the data was organized. So, and I think it would be and helpful for you. By the way, it's a very long report. However, they do have an executive summary. Yes. It's very <laughs> I beneficial. So. I appreciated the executive summary. Yes. I thought, oh, my God, these, are, these definitely are graduate students. They can crank things out like that. Yes. Totally. <laughs> All right, any final, um, Raheem, did you have anything? I'm actually a little, since you uh, have some additional background, do you have any thoughts? I'd be really interested in hearing what you have to say about this process, where we are and where we're trying to go. I don't have much to offer, but I, I did, uh, the group that um, was working with the uh, Social Service Commission, the, uh, the uh, presentation and the piece that they sent, uh, as a response to the Davis Police Department, uh, I thought was very interesting and I thought it contained a, a lot of information and a lot of insight into some things that I hope that will be incorporated uh, by the discussions uh, that the uh, commission is moving forward with or the subcommittee is moving forward with. I, I thought that, uh, and I haven't read through all of what they uh, sent, but uh, just in reading the summary and looking into some of the things, I thought that they were spot on on a lot of things uh, because those things are playing out in a lot of uh, communities uh, across uh, the country. And the other thing that uh, I would say is, uh, uh, I, 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 think, I guess this is back to a point that was made earlier, I'm not sure who made it. Uh, I, I, I really think that there is probably more advantage in having cross collaborations like members from various uh, uh, different uh, commissions working together, uh, looking at this as opposed to just siloing it into you know, the Human Relations Commission, the Social Service Commission, the Police Accountability Commission. I, I you know, I, I think that um, 
there, it would be uh, much more effective and much more productive if there were some smaller groups of folks that, for, that were from the different commissions that were together. Because I think they would bring different perspectives and different insights uh, to their discussions. And then what they, what they developed and what they could then bring back to the group as a whole to help shape and guide the recommendations, I think would be a lot more productive and a lot more insightful. I think that's that is what we're doing. We have the the the, tr the three commissions are have representatives from each of them. That's the, what we were reporting on is the human relations, social services, and social um, and police accountability have representatives, and then we're going back to to each of them. No, I I I, I may have misunderstood what I was saying. Is I think that representatives from each of those commissions uh, should also be working with each other in those oh. smaller oh groups. in the smaller groups oh i hear you now yeah. thank you thank you for it's clarifying much more productive and, uh, uh, and cross-pollinating that way as opposed to just uh having uh things in smaller groups of of uh, bigger commissions come to a an agreement with what they want or what they think they should move forward i think that mm -hmm. having a mixture of those folks uh get it it, it, it makes for better robust discussion about things. And I think that uh, the end product that comes from that uh, uh, is uh, a lot more insightful. Thank you. Thank you for that. Sheila? Yes, Helen. I just emailed you and Carrie, the social services, that sheet that has all of those resources. Thank you so much. I, that gets one thing I asked, I asked for Carrie to get it to the whole committee, but. Okay, great. Okay, any other questions or comments? Um, Kelly, from a, a Brown Act standpoint, um, because we're all on different commissions, like I could talk to people on the other commissions, right? Because that's not... Yeah, you should try to not talk with uh, what would be the quarum of the, 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 the three-part group, if that makes sense. So. so there's, okay, so not a quorum of the, but I could talk like one person from each of the other. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions, comments? There's just public comment. I know there's okay. at least one person with their hand raised. So thank you. I appreciate the reminder. Okay, let's go to public comment then, please. I have one public commenter. Mm -hmm. Connor Gorman, you're unmuted. Go ahead, Connor. Hi again. Uh, so I just had a few things that I wanted to bring up. So first, I really like the suggestion of having the subcommittees of the subcommittee be kind of mixed. I was also a bit perplexed by why they all seem to be separated out by commission again, even though the whole point of the subcommittee was to like have all three together. Uh, in terms of language, I agree that language is important and I do like the word community and community groups and community safety and all that. But I, I do think public safety can be powerful as well. And I also know that police and state institutions like to appropriate language and basically take it away from the people. And we need to try to take it back in a lot of those cases. So another example of this is police often being called peace officers, even though what they do is in no way peaceful. And when police break up demonstrations and protests, they often say they're doing so in the name of the people of California, when that is definitely not what they're doing it in the name of. They are actually just protecting the ruling class. So I do think that it's an important conversation for us to discuss whether it should be public safety or community safety. And I like the term community safety as well. But for public safety, I do think that there's an argument to be made that we should take back that term and not let it be appropriated by policing. Right now, I agree that it largely is, but that's not what public safety should be. And we should try to reclaim it. And then the last thing that I wanna say is I'm in favor of a model where social workers or other outreach and health professionals go to situations separately from the police. Uh, I know that there's different views on this and there's certainly some people who think that it would be better 
to have both groups go together. Um, but there are definitely people who believe that having police go at all can be harmful. And I know this is part of the YOLO People Power Research Group. Their research and presentation discuss this a bit. And I believe they are also largely in favor of a separate model where you have separate departments and the default is to only send like social workers or other such professionals and to only bring in police if needed. And that is the model that I am also in favor of, having separate departments where the default is having these separate workers go out. And obviously the same way that police and fire work together, regardless of how I feel about that, they do. And that could also be true of these two departments as well in certain situations. Thank you, Connor. All right, we appreciate your public comment. Okay, so um, that then, unless any, if anyone has any additional words on that agenda item. Okay, so we, the future agenda items will be, this will be coming back again at our next meeting. We will be in touch to make sure that our next meeting is appropriately timed with the, um, the next um, tri-group meeting that happens so that we can um, come back and report, get your input again, and continue to make sure that we have broad input as possible. Are, are there any additional agenda items that we should be including? All right, then the next agenda item, please, Kelly, is any additional, now we're back to the, the circle of communication. This is what, in case you forgot in the beginning, any additional communication from, from commissioners or staff? Stay healthy, everyone. Stay safe. Yeah. We're gonna make it through us. <laughs> All right, then I believe the next is the adjournment. Okay, great to see your faces. Hope you're well. Good to see everybody, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you, yeah. Diane. Thank you, yeah, thank Kelly. You. Diane, good job. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, everyone.